This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 55, Cutting the Muster. Last time, the two opposing armies marched to the agreed-upon battlefield, Kurukshetra, and set up camp. The Pandavas elected their father-in-law, King Drupad, to be their commanding general. On the Karava side, it was Bhishma who was elected to that post. Going forward from here, the cast of characters gets downright unmanageable. We have a total of 18 armies taking part in this conflict, and each of these armies is led by its own general. Add to that the numerous relatives, friends, and neighbors, and our list of names easily tops 30 or 40. We can be grateful that Duryodhana's 100 brothers don't have a lot of distinguishing characteristics, but things are still going to get hard to follow as we get into the war itself. My suspicion is that back when the epic was still undergoing revisions, every king wanted to see their venerable ancestors taking part in the famous war. So the list of names is simply impossible to keep track of. I promise to do my best to keep you abreast of who these peripheral characters are whenever they enter the scene. By the end of last episode, King Dhritarashtra asked his charioteer and confidant, Sanjay, to narrate the events on the battlefield and in the opposing camps. Either Sanjay had a marvelous spy network, or he had the power of clairvoyance, because somehow, sitting in the king's palace, the charioteer was aware of every conversation happening in both camps. I recall that the Hindi TV series, as well as the Peter Brook film, included a scene where Krishna grants this ability to Sanjay. But so far, no such thing has happened in either of my versions of this book. And I don't see how it could happen later, since Krishna is going to have his hands full dealing with the war. Still, there could be an element of truth in these pictorials, because I would have guessed that Sanjay's talent stemmed from his early adoption of bhakti towards Krishna. In any case, much of the coming battle books will be narrated as a conversation between Sanjay and Dhritarashtra. Sanjay had just begun this grand narration when we finished the last episode. The first event he described had to do with an odious gambling friend of Shakuni's named Uluka. Duryodhana summoned this guy and sent him off on an embassy to the Pandavas with some messages for each of them. Obediently, Uluka went under the immunity of a messenger to the Pandava camp. He addressed Yudhishthira, saying, You know how it is with messengers. What I'm about to say are the words of my master and not mine, so please don't take it out on me. Yudhishthira replied, Uluka, you have nothing to fear. Go ahead and speak as you are commanded to by your greedy and short-sighted master. I think Uluka rather relished his immunity. It allowed him to safely tear into and insult his betters without fear of retribution, at least for now. Speaking for Duryodhana, the son of a gambler said, Hear now what the great-spirited king has to say to you. He says it was a surprise that we took all your possessions and molested your wife, yet you just let us do that and you ran off to hide in the woods for twelve years. What kind of man are you? And now you think you can beat me? Well, go ahead and try. But what do you hope to gain from this? Bhishma and Drona are both invincible on the battlefield, so what are you thinking? It's time for you to quit all your bragging and boasting and start fighting. Any wretch can brag, but it won't be for long. To Arjun, he said, You know that God placed me over you, and let me enjoy your kingdoms for the last twelve years and God shall help me to continue to enjoy it for much longer, after you are dead. What good was your fancy Gandava bow when you became my slave at the dice game? And Bhima's club did not save you then. No, you had to be rescued by a woman. In Virata, you hid yourself in fear, dressed as a girl, while Bhima Sena slaved in the kitchens. You know, I did that to you, because that is what happens to cowardly Kshatriyas who run from a fight. You know, I did that to you because that's what happens to cowardly Kshatriyas who run from a fight. So go ahead and try using your magic tricks. Even a thousand Krishnas could not help you now. The brothers, especially Bhima, were all smoking mad by this point. So Krishna helpfully stepped in to dismiss this foul little messenger. He said, The Pandavas have heard what you've come to say, so go back to your master now, and tell him we pay no heed to your wild ravings. Tomorrow you will know the truth or falsehood of everything you have said. Arjun then added, We know the source of your arrogance. You think that we will not kill our own uncle. But you'll see that Bhishma shall be the first one I kill, right before the eyes of you and your cronies. Thus, Luka returned to his master and relayed the reply. Duryodhana heard him out and then ordered the army to be mustered at dawn. The next morning, before sunrise, 
the vast Karva army stood arrayed and battle ready before their commander. Addressing Duryodhana, the elder Kuru made an inventory of the heroes and warriors that made up the cream of their army. Bhishma began by declaring the two types of warriors that could be found among their allies and supporters. He said, Great king, listen now to my accounting of your warriors. You have many millions of ratas, as well as a myriad of atiratas. These are the foremost among them. Bhishma then counted off each of the named fighters on the Karva side, rating them each on a scale from rata to atirata. From what I could glean from the internet, a rata is a chariot warrior, something like a medieval knight in armor. Atirata is way beyond that. It is defined as a warrior who is capable of fighting 60,000 opponents at one time. Obviously, the vast majority of the fighters fell in the rata category. Some people make a big deal out of this rating system in the epic, so I'll tell you how he rated the main characters of the story, starting with the 100 Carver brothers. Some people make a big deal out of this rating system in the epic, so I'll tell you how Bhishma rated the main characters of the story. Starting with the 100 Carver brothers, he rated them all as ratas. As for himself, Bhishma said, I will not tell you my own talents, for you already know them. Next, he mentioned King Shalya, who had originally marched to the help of the Pandavas, but was tricked into serving the Karvas in war. Shalya promised to make trouble with Karna when the time came. Bhishma rated him a full Atirata. Next came Jayadrata, king of Sindh. This was the guy who tried to run off with Draupadi, but was waylaid and had his hair shaven by Bhimasena. Afterward, he propitiated Shiva and was granted the ability to stop the four lesser Pandavas' attack, briefly. Bhishma rated him worth two ratas. Duryodhana and brother Dushasan both had one son each in the army, and they too got rated as ratas. Their guru Kripa is mentioned and flattered, but not rated. Next came the gambling uncle Shakuni. According to Bhishma, he was no slouch on the battlefield. He was rated Ratha. Next up was Drona's ill-fated son, Ashvataman. This guy whinnied like a horse the day he was born, and this omen was taken to mean that he would commit some terrible deed in the future. Bhishma said he could rate him as an Atiratha, but in fact he didn't even count as a Ratha because, like all Brahmins, he just loved his life too much to be a great fighter. His pride and attachments were too much for a true warrior. Like Kripa, Drona is praised but not rated. Karna's son, Vrhasena, was a Rata. The next warrior to be named was a Rakshasa king, Aliyuda, who, we are told, had feuded with the Pandavas and bore them a grudge. If this was mentioned before, I've forgotten when. The next to be mentioned was poor Karna. Bhishma had this to say about him. And as for your beloved friend who prodded you into this war, that vile braggart Karna, is neither Rata nor Atirata. He stupidly lost his inborn armor and has been cursed by Parashurama. I rate him a half Rata. When he finally faces Arjun, he'll be a goner for sure. Drona heartily agreed to this. He chimed in, What you say is no lie. In battle after battle, he always runs away. This guy is meek and addled. He's half a Rata. Karna's eyes nearly popped out as he was forced to listen to this but he tried to keep his cool as he addressed his superiors. He said, Grandfather, come on. All the time, you're always putting me down. For Diodana's sake, I put up with it. But now you rate me as impotent and cowardly? You know what? You're the half Ratha, not me. You're always wishing us ill and pining for your favorites across the field. The king doesn't see it, but only you would belittle our allies by putting down their achievements. Based on the people you like and don't like, you have made up this capricious rating system. It only serves to divide our friends and strengthen our enemies. He turned to Diyarodhana and said, Please consider this. Cast out this ill-intentioned Bhishma. He's undermining your strength. It's the easiest thing to break up an army as great as this, but it will be very difficult to join it up again. He is demoralizing us in the worst way. I'm telling you, this old guy is senile. He's lost his wits. To him, no one is ever good enough. The scriptures say, one should obey the elderly, but not the senile. Karna then reiterated his pledge not to fight until Bhishma was out of commission. Bhishma heaved a big sigh and said, 
If I did not have this terrible commission to carry out, I would silence you for good, Sutputra. You should remember that at the Swamvar of the princesses of Kashi, all the kings and nobles were unable to stop me, alone in my chariot, from taking those girls. But then, ever since you came around, there's been nothing but disaster for the Kurus. Duryodhana finally intervened, asking Bhishma to get on with his muster. So Bhishma continued. He said, I already finished with the guys on our side, so now I'll tell you how I rate the fighters on the Pandavas' side. He started with the five brothers. Yudhishthira, Nakul, and Sahadev each counted as one Ratha. Bhimasena was as good as eight Rathas. And for Arjun, Bhishma said, As for red-eyed Gudakesha, with Krishna at his back, there's no warrior like him anywhere, not among the gods, Dhanavas, Rakshasas, nor Yakshas. Neither in the past nor in the future will there ever be a fighter as accomplished as Arjun. This champion can kill off your army while he protects his own. Only Drona and I can withstand his assault. There's no one else capable of that. But Arjun, backed by Krishna, is young and skilled, while we are old and decrepit. Bhishma then went on to rate all the main characters on the Pandava side. Interestingly, they are almost all rated as Miratas. This includes the sons of Draupadi, Arjun's son Abhimanyu, the kings Virata and Drupad, Drupad's transsexual son Sikandin, and Bhima's Rakshasa son Gatokacha. Drupad's son Drustadyumna merited the rank of Atirata, as did Kunti Boja, the same Kunti Boja who had adopted Kunti and let her be molested by that twisted sadhu. Those two somewhat obscure characters were the only ones to merit the rank of Atirata in the Pandava camp. Bhishma summed up his report, saying that he considered himself personally capable of wiping out the entire enemy force, with the exception of his five nephews, any women, or anyone who used to be a woman. Bhishma said, For you may have heard that Sikandin was once a woman. Born a girl, he later became a man. I shall not fight him. I'm going to stop right here, because the tale of Amba is just too good to stick on the end of this episode. It deserves an episode of its own. So next time we'll hear the story of Sikandin, his past lives, his vendettas, and his sex change. Thanks for listening. <laughs>